Lord have mercy. Trump's White House. Trump's White House. I mean, I lived through the Nixon era. I thought that was a mess. Boy, I swear to God. And you know what? Somebody said something uh, to me, and I totally agree. But first of all, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, family. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the mental house with me, your host, Khadija. No, I'm not fiending. I'm on my ball, okay? Stretching out those calves and my hamstring. <laughs> um, so, in case you wonder, I don't have the shakes. Uh, you know, somebody said to me, said, straight out of the minds of Caucasian people. And I just don't understand how, um, if everybody is so repulsed by Donald Trump, how did he make it to the presidency? So, obviously, there's a few that are despondent. But collectively, white folks, you guys are dropping the ball. You're dropping the ball. And I'm, I'm saying that because... The DeSantis guy, the guy that ran against, I mean, won against the Gilliam in um, Florida, <laughs> straight racist, um, and I guess it just be fitting that racists are all over the place uh, because this country was built on race, and whenever you build a country on race, you cannot act as if race is not an issue. That is the narcissism of the whole thing. Nobody wants to get honest and talk about how this country was founded. It was founded on slaughtering the Native American, bringing black people over as slaves, getting free labor for hundreds of years. And then when you when you decided that that was not free labor anymore, you start killing us. That has been the mantra um, from the day of emancipation till today. It has never stopped. Black bodies are what fuels the engine. Black bodies are the host for the predator narcissist of America. The way this engine is running, it has created a system that is working very well. And the part, I guess, that gets me, and I like to um, look at things not only from a small perspective but from a you know a, a, a universal perspective and I realize that there is a mantra that some people say well if you don't speak about it it'll go away or my relatives had this happen to them when they crossed over on the boat the thing about it is if you're not still being um, desegregated against today if you are not being made a target today today in your today if you are experiencing a privilege because of your skin, you don't fit into the category of a descendant of a slave. And so that is hard for a lot of people to, to get. I think Jane Elliott gets it. I think a few white people get it. Um, but more than not, the ones that do get it, it's not that they're so sick that they don't. They, they know that they would have to share the wealth. And that's not what they want to do. So instead of doing that, they'll act oblivious to what's going on and then say to you, well, just realize that we all have had it difficult. Yeah, but at some point, the Holocaust stopped for you. And I, and I want to remind my Caucasian listeners of that. And unless you can say the same thing for us, I really don't want to hear those kind of comments because for me, they're insulting. You know, anytime we're continue to be redlined against, anytime we continue to have subpar lending rates, anytime we continue to have um, superior, uh, subpar products coming to our community with uh, gouged up prices, I mean, come on. Until you're willing to address those type of issues, what you're saying makes no sense to us. And I think that what you're going to see from the election going forward is that black people are starting to realize that we've been retarded um, in this. Oh, I'm sorry if that wasn't politically correct. Um, but in this political game, we've lost our way. And we've allowed a few black people to accept trinkets and, and, and um, uh, you know, monies. People like 
you know, Al Sharpton and these people that have pretty much led us to the slaughter or have sold us out without addressing the issues that are keeping us perpetually sick. And the reason why I'm speaking about this today, because I, as I think about all the killing and stuff and all the retribution in that book I got finished reading, uh, The Color of Law, um, then, you, you know, you can't help but look at Ida B. Wells and her writings and just her as a a very strong lady, a lady just like um, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, women who have always risked assassination, who have risked um, betrayal, Harriet Tubman, have risked all kinds of stuff just to speak and to get the message out of the kind of treatment that were being done to us by the master narcissist. And so the reason why I keep calling them the master narcissist, a lot of people say, why do you keep saying that? Why do you say that? Because America as a whole is a narcissistic system. It's a system that has all these institutions set up and from, from where we sit, um, and I was when I say we, I'm, I'm just meaning specifically descendants of slaves, black people whose ancestors were slaves in this country. Everything that you have today, the prison industrial complex, all that stuff that we know that is fueled by black and black bodies is a way of it's slavery. So it was never ended. So when I saw this writing by Ida B. Wells and the name of it, of it is Lynched for Anything or Nothing, I decided to share it with you because it's so it's just reminiscent of what we're dealing with right now. Here and now. Here and now. Yep. Okay. In nearly all communities, wife beating is punishable with a fine. Wow. And in no community is it made a felony. Dave Jackson of Abita, Louisiana, was a colored man who had beaten his wife. He had not killed her nor seriously wounded her. But as Louisiana lynchers had not filled out their quota crimes, his case was deemed of sufficient importance to apply the method of that barbarous people. He was in custody of the officials, but the mob went to the jail and took him out in front of the person and hanged him by the neck until he was dead. This was November 1893. Um, these are the letters that Ida B. Wells in the articles that she wrote that put her into hiding and they put a, a price tag on her head because just for her to keep a record of things that were going on at this time, at this time, that of course um, the larger society tries to whitewash and try to erase out of history, but it's a very important history because it's part of my history and I refuse to allow people to say to me that my history is not important even though I can sit up here and see all these things every time I turn on the history channel I'm hearing about the Jews and Hitler and all this stuff so obviously there's some kind of craziness going on that you want me to forget my story or they don't even talk about it and it is the most hideous brutal story that's ever been done in mankind but yet you can still force this other stuff down my throat come on now Come on now. It don't work that way. Now let's just listen to American history. Details are very meager of a lynching which occurred near Knox Point, Louisiana on the 24th of October, 1893. Upon the one point, however, there is there was no uncertainty, and that is that the persons lynched were Negroes. It was claimed that they had been stealing hogs but even this claim had not been subjugated to the investigation of a court. That matter was not considered necessary. Of course not. A few of the neighbors who had just lost hogs suspected these men were responsible for their loss and made up in their minds to furnish an example for others to be warned by. The two men were secured by a mob and hanged. One of the most notable instances of lynching for the year of 1893 occurred about the 20th of September. It was notable for the fact that the mayor, the city, the, the mayor of the city exerted every 
available power to protect the victim of the lynching from the mob. I mean, the mayor tried to protect them from the mob. So it says, in this splendid endeavor upon the law to uphold the law, the mayor called out the truth. And the result was a deadly fight between the militia and the mob. Nine of the mob was killed. The trouble occurred at Roanoke, Virginia, and it is frequently claimed that the lynches occur only in sparingly settled districts. And in fact, it is a favorite plea of the governors and reverend apologists to a couple of errant falsehoods stating that lynchings only occur because of assaults upon white women and that these assaults occur and the lynchings follow in a thinly inhabited districts where the power of the law is entirely inadequate to meet the emergency. Wow. You see how they got a line or rhyme or reason for everything? You see how the lying narcissist just can come up with a lie that quick? See how his head spin like a dispenser? and like, like you're crazy? Okay. This Roanoke case is a double refute, refutation. For it not only disproved the alleged charge that the Negro assaulted a white woman, as was telegraphed all over the country at the time, but it also shows the conclusive in, shows conclusively that even in one of the largest cities of the old state of Virginia, one of the original 13 colonies, which prides itself on being a mother of presidents, it is possible, it was possible for a lynching to occur in broad daylight under the circumstances of revolting savagery. Re just revolting savagery in broad daylight. And this is what they want to turn out, make America great again? Make America great for who? Are you kidding me? Y'all, y'all crazy. Y'all crossed the line. You been crossed the line. You crossed the line when you took the land from the Native American. You don't think you're going to have to honor? You don't think you're going to have to pay for your crimes against humanity? You don't think the old great white feather, the great octanine, whoever you call it, the great power, the great, well, whoever you call her, are going to make you pay for the crimes you committed? You don't think karma is a, karma, karma is going to come back to bite us in the ass. For all these crimes against humanity. And y'all just don't think it. Y'all want to keep on doing the dirt that you continue to do. You want to keep on playing this race crazy ass game that you invented. That has hurt you way more than it's hurt us. Because you are so fucking delusional that if you had to live one day in black skin, it would kill you. Most of y'all couldn't take it. Most of the experiments that I've seen done, like in movies Black Like Me or and, and people who have decided to be black for a day a week, uh, they never make it to the, um, you know, pre-described uh, point. They never make it. The predisposed site that they agreed upon, they never make it because they can't take it. And the pain body that you have created for us has created a mental illness in us. Being subjugated to your craziness and your gaslighting. It is just a hot bed of mess that white people got to fix. And they're not willing to fix it. Collectively, y'all drop the ball. Collectively, you suck. Individually, of course, you can find some good people everywhere. It's an exception to every rule. But collectively, man, y'all got some retribution. Anyway, uh, uh, let me let me let me go past this. When the news first came from Roanoke of the contemplated lynching, it was stated that a big burly Negro had assaulted a white woman, that he had been apprehended, and that the citizens were determined to summarily dispose of his case. Mayor Trout was a man who believed in maintaining the majesty of law and who at once gave notice that no lynching would be permitted in Roanoke and that the Negro, whose name was Smith, being in custody of the law, 
should be dealt with according to the law. But the mob did not pay any attention to the brave words from the mayor. You see, this is what I'm saying. They get to break all fucking all kinds of laws as they deem necessary. As I mean, they just get to do whatever. They get to run amok with their privilege. They get to run a fucking muck. It's just that simple. This is sad. And excuse my language, but it is um I gotta keep it real. Um it is evidently thought that it was only another case of swagger, such as frequently characterizes lynching episodes. Mayor Trout finding immense crowds gathering about the city and fearing an attempt to lynch Smith called out the militia and stationed them right at the jail. Now you can't tell me that this is, this is a case of an individual, a good white man. This is a case of a man that tried to uphold law. And he was like, no, y'all not going to do this. So this is what I'm saying. White people get to start mobs. <laughs> they get to collect uh, collectively become a lynch mob. Uh a police force, and they get to have all this behavior exonerated. And they expect us to continue to keep pushing and pushing and pushing, pushing and eating and com and just pushing all this pain on us without some type of retaliation. Because yeah, that's what it amounts to. Just take what I give you, just like the narcissist. Take what I give you, shut the fuck up, and feel good about it. Don't even talk about it. Keep it. We don't have to make it even in secret. But you got to act like you got to like it. <laughs> and you don't get to complain about it. Because we're in charge. We're in control. And we control you. And the rest of them. Anyway. It was known that the woman refused to accuse Smith of assaulting her. It was known that the woman refused to accuse Smith of assaulting her and that his offense consisted in quarreling with her about the change of money in a transaction in which he bought something from her at the market booth. Both parties lost their tempers and the result was a row from which Smith had to make his escape. At once, the old cry was sounded that the woman had been raped. In a few hours, all the town was wild with people thirsting for the assailant's blood and further incidents that other day that may well be told by dispatch from Roanoke under the date of the 21st of September and published on the Chicago Record. See, see, this is complete madness. These people are complete mad because the behavior hasn't changed hasn't changed not one bit it was claimed by members of the militia company that they frequently warned the mob to keep away from the jail Hi, Mama. hey sweetie how are you i'm doing good <laughs> you doing good yes yeah well you want to sit on my lap while i finish reading this yes okay that sounds good yeah, you gotta sit right here. Uh, you're a big girl now. Uh, okay, let me finish reading this, okay? All right. Okay. It is claimed by the military company that they frequently warn the mob to keep away from the jail under penalty of being shot. Captain Burr told him that he was under order to protect a prisoner whose life the mob so eagerly sought. And come what may... He would not allow him to be taken by the mob. This is the mayor. To this, the crowd replied with hoots and derisive cheers. The rioters appeared to become frenzied at the determined stand taken by the men and the Captain Bird. The men and Captain Bird, and finally, a crowd of excited men made a rush for the side door of the jail. The captain directed his men to drive the would-be lynchers back. At this moment, the mob opened fire on the soldiers. Y'all hear me? Did you hear what I said? Um, somebody said, no 
nothing kills like depraved white white men. No other man, no other beast. And um, what I mean by collectively, you guys have dropped the ball. Because these are not your John Brown, Jane Elliott, Tim Weiss type of white people. These are mentally ill, insane, bloodthirsty, berserkers. Vikings. Those type of guys. You know, um, there's no other way to dis describe it. They opened fire on the soldiers. This appeared for a moment to startle the captain and his men. But it was only for a moment. Then he coolly gave the command. Ready, aim, fire. The company obeyed to the instant. And poured a volley of bullets into that part of the mob. Which was trying to batter down the side of the jail door. The rioters fell back before the fire of the militia. Leaving one man writhing in the agonies of death at the doorstep. There was a lull for a moment. Then the word was quickly passed through the throng in the front of the jail down the street that a man was killed. Then there was an awful rush towards the little band of soldiers. Excited men were yelling like demons. And the fight became general. And here it was ended nine men were dead and more than 40 more were wounded. They had a complete psychotic breakdown. And for their bloodthirst, not able to get to the prisoner. My God. This stubborn stand on behalf of law and order disconcerted the crowd and it fell back in disorder. It did not long remain inactive, but assembled again for a second assault. Having only a small band of militia and knowing they would be absolutely at the mercy of thousands who were gathering to wreak vengeance upon them. The mayor ordered them to disperse and go to their homes. And he himself, having been wounded, was quietly conveyed out of the city. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. The next day, the mob grew in numbers and its rage increased in its intensity. There was no longer any doubt that Smith, innocent as he was of any crime, would be killed. For with the mayor out of the city and the governor of the state using no effort to control the mob, it was only a question of hours when the assault would be repeated and his victim put to death. All of this happened as per program. The description of the morning car carnival appeared in the paper above and quoted the red, red is quoted as follows. A squad of 20 men took the Negro Smith from three policemen just before five o'clock this morning and hanged him from a hickory limb on Ninth Avenue in the residence section of the city. They riddled his body with bullets and put a place guard on his saying, This is Mayor Trout's friend. A coroner's jury of Bismill was surrounded and viewed the body and rendered the verdict of death at the hands of unknown men. Thousands of persons visited the scene of the lynching between daylight and 8 o'clock when the body was cut down. Let me repeat that to y'all because I want you to understand why at this uh, juncture in 2018 we're not going to get any justice. In 2000, and this is, has breeded a culture in people that assassinate us, even how we treat each other, has breeded a culture that we don't mean anything. The mayor can't stop white people from amassing crowds because the law and disorder can be wreaked upon us at any time as long as they say it's okay. I'm going to stop this and then I'm going to come back. Uh,